join us here today in this webinar. Uh, my name is Shana Dumont Gar, and I'm the curator of Fruitlands Museum, which is based in Hartford, Massachusetts. And um, I'd like to first acknowledge that I'm presenting to you today from Pawtucket Territory, which is closely related to the nearby Nipmuc, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag tribal nations, presently known as Acton, Massachusetts. And a similar background applies to what is presently known as Harvard, Massachusetts, where Fruitlands Museum is located. And as an uninvited settler, I acknowledge the violence of the past and admit wrongs, including native erasure and genocide. And I am receptive to learn better ways to communicate and celebrate indigenous continuance from now onward. I'd also like to introduce um, my two colleagues who are with me today. Um, Catherine Shortliff is the engagement manager of the museum and Elizabeth James Perry, who is an enrolled member of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina and a 2020 artist in residence at Fruitlands Museum. Uh, Elizabeth creates contemporary artwork and it is also part of the Northeastern Woodlands tradition. Her wampum porcupine quill work and textile weaving demonstrate an ongoing and responsive connection to her coastal Massachusetts homeland. Additionally, Elizabeth combines material heritage reclamation work with her artistic practice, which aligns directly with today's conversation about decolonization. Uh, wanted to also let you all know that we will record this program and we do invite and welcome your questions. So you can submit your questions through the Q&A tab. And the first half hour will contain me and Elizabeth um, providing some information. And then the second half, about halfway through, Catherine will be returning and helping us moderate through questions that we'll be very happy to answer. So in order to just start up this conversation, which let's be honest, we're here for an hour, but it could last for probably the weeks. Um, but let's let's have a really good hour together. Um, we're going to begin with me asking Elizabeth to introduce the concept of decolonization. Quite a setup. Thank you, uh, Shana. Um, first of all, thank you to the Fruitlands for hosting me in this um, hour-long uh, curator's talk and Q&A. Um, so when I'm talking about decolonization, I always have to think about the time that I have um, as well as the audience. And uh, realistically speaking, colonization, the act of colonizing the New England area, North America, um, is an endeavor that took mm, roughly 400 years and it's ongoing. Um, decolonizing, so undoing those um, changes, uh, erasure, removal, um, being considered uh, sort of second-class citizens in your own home, which is ironic and terrible and funny sometimes, depending on how dark a day I'm having. Um, being that and working towards being, once again, recognized as a sovereign nation, having autonomy, speaking for oneself, um, having a tribal nation speak for themselves, represent their interests, their priorities, their arts, their values in their own voice, is really important. That's decolonization. It is authentic. It does come from the source. It can't be faked. Um, you know, it's just not going to come from the same place. It's not going to come from people who are indigenous to the soil who've been here for better than 10,000 years. You know, our languages are, are really complex and our viewpoints are complex, um, but we haven't had in many, in, in many instances, a good platform for sharing a lot of that effectively, because oftentimes we're, you know, historically we've been pushed aside and others have represented us and rep misrepresented, I guess I would say sometimes, um, depending on the situation, misrepresented our interests. Um, and so decolonization is working back to that point of having the indigenous people in the room present face to face um, it's honest. It's not always comfortable or easy. Um, it's, it's just a, a long process, but very worthwhile, I think. I'm muting myself again. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> the way 
I like the way that there's there's so many ways we could frame it. And there's so many kind of metaphors and um, synonyms. And um, I like how you began with the undoing as a nice broad word. And I like to also think about decolonizing <clears throat> as a way of representing history, that we're not taking away anything that happened in history, but rather than presenting it like one monolith or say, for example, like a tree or teleological, like that things were dark and then they keep getting more and more light or they keep making more and more sense that we look at it more like a rhizome, like it's expanding in every direction mm -hmm. and that valid information could come from all these multiple angles and connect in okay. often at first unexpected ways. Um, and so one, one kind of funny anecdote that some of our people joining us, so you and I have been working together for a little while and I thought I'd share this anecdote of me kind of learning in action from you, um, where we were in the gallery one day, like months ago, pre pandemic, and pre even knowing that there'd be a pandemic really. Um, and we were talking about the research you had been doing and how we would present it. So you have this deep knowledge of um, the the arrow point industry and also objectively where an arrow point might have come from can be learned from a close look at the point and at the, the stone that it's made from and we were talking we we're proposing different ways to display it and I said oh I have an idea let's just center it on the wall and do a nice straight line and you just kind of look at me and you're like mm hmm I don't know if I want to do a timeline and really do we need to do a straight line and then you went on to explain more about why which I know you'll be getting into as well. So that was a good pause for me to say, oh, okay, I think I really am influenced by European ways of <laughs> communicating. <laughs> so I thought um, in order to kind of provide a little bit more basis for our conversation, I'd share just a little bit about where are we coming from and a little bit about Fruitlands Museum. So I will share the screen and we can see a little PowerPoint we have. And I just have a couple of images. This first one has a group in 1931. This is outside of this hillside for anyone who has visited Fruitlands, this will be familiar. It's a very steep kind of abrupt um, piece of land and Fruitlands Museum is on Prospect Hill Road and it is literally a prospect and you can see miles all the way to New Hampshire and uh, to Wachusett Mountain in central Massachusetts. So we have Clara Endicott Sears, the founder um, in Victorian dress holding a handbag and looking down to the left and then we also have Chief Buffalo Bear, Sue, and then next to him we have Philip Sears who is a sculptor of the bronze statue Pamanangwet, and this is commemorating both the addition of this Philip Sears bronze sculpture that is very well known to those who visit the museum today. Um, the museum first opened in 1929, and um, so I share this because I see all the children um, lined up in a very regimented area manner, and I had just shared this kind of idea of straight line good <laughs> makes sense <laughs> to me i you know one two three four and how that is so part of how i want to share things and how i'm learning now that that is not the only way to share things and to have the kids standing in a straight line up the hill up to side to side in these troops um first of all it very visually makes these troops look um like they're they're on their way to become part of kind of a military force <laughs> which is um, something just visually interesting, but also um, it's this influence that I think today, if we bring today that we have a we have a collection that we're continuing to share, that we really do want to think about these next generations, and that's a lot of what is going on. Um, so we are pleased to have the opportunity that the collection provides us, but I wanted to share just that it does have a problematic history. Um, that is the reality. The premise is problematic. And to sum it up, it was put together by a single viewpoint, that of Clara Endicott Sears. It was not put together as a group. There were not multiple voices in the room talking about what would be shared and why, whether to focus on New England or um, to focus across the entire country of uh, North America, which Clara did decide to do. 
So this is an interior um, in 1931, and we can see um, a mix of different things, including um, a floor pattern that has since been covered because the imagery is sacred and it's not appropriate for it to be stepped upon. Um, and, and so there has been a very slow motion undoing of a lot of the things that Clara felt it was important to present. And um, so this idea that it was presented, many things that might be considered art were presented more in an anthropological manner. And you could also say that they might be romanticized um, and sentimentalized. And I think just to sum up, describing a lot of things as though the people who made them are truly no longer around, which is a deeply painful premise and um, way of sharing it. So I, I want to conclude with this image, which is from the late 1960s and early 1970s. We don't have an exact date, but you can see the cars just beyond the youth, um, giving you a hint of this time period. Um, but then you also see the feather headdress um, on one of the young men or the boys and children and this idea of casually putting it on if the full context of this headdress and what it means was properly shared with that little guy he probably it would never have occurred to him to put it on and so it's kind of like there's a whole puzzle and they might have seen on that trip to Fruitlands Museum in 1969 they might have had three puzzle pieces presented to them and so we're, we're hoping that we keep moving forward to present more of the puzzle, which th there's no other way to do it than to have a community involved. Um, and so we do have a six person advisory team that was formed in 2019 and Elizabeth is part of that team. And that's helping us to um, make decisions such as foregrounding the presentation of this collection with contemporary artists and their work, um, both traditional and um, more experimental and avant-garde. And this is a gradual shift. Um, it did begin in 2019 and now it's kind of moving forward um, as, as swiftly as we can, but also given that it's a conversation, so those things do take time. Um, so I think before I ask Elizabeth another question, I wanted to just state that we require specificity in what we share. Um, and so we are welcoming Native communities to both use the space, both the space that is public and the space that is with objects in storage. And, um, and it's been really quite an honor for me to be a part of that process of shifting. So to conclude, I'm gonna move forward to one of your images, Elizabeth, and keep sharing my screen because I have a few of your images while you speak. Um, I wonder if you could share with us the work that you've done for your residency. Uh -huh. um, Certainly. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. That was a great, great lead in. And I love those images that you shared too. <laughs> They're so appropriate to the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they span pretty much the continent in museum experiences too. I think it's real common that kind of slow change right. to something that's a little more authentic um, and grounded in, in truth and uh, indigenous perspective. Um, so in my, over the course of my residency, uh, I worked with a number of different materials. Um, one of the art forms that's near and dear to my heart is traditional porcupine quill work. And um, porcupines, excuse me, cover a huge area in North America. So it's, it's another native um, material of choice. Uh, you know, I think when you're hunting and things, you don't necessarily waste fur, you don't waste hair, you don't waste claws. Each thing has its use, and some of those uses are to make things beautiful. So porcupine quill embroidery and woven porcupine quill work, which is what you see here. My brother very nicely modeled it for me. Um, this is a man's cuff made from woven porcupine quills. I actually tend to use natural dyes. I um, took a long time to revive natural dye work in the Northeast because I was using a lot of commercially processed yarns and um, they contain dyes that were quite toxic. And I found, I loved being able to weave like an eight hour day at a museum, let's say. Um, that was like a dream job for me when I was younger, but I was finding that I was coughing at the end of every day. And um, I started to look at the materials I was handling and it, it occurred to me, um, they were toxic. And they were materials that were being made to wear, no less. And so you sort of think about the chain of effects 
the environment being affected in the production of the piece as I produce the piece and then later potentially causing more harm when it was worn. So there's a lifetime of damage, I think, um, from inappropriate materials and inappropriate um, chemicals. Uh, and um, it made me a lot more aware of things and it helped to really connect me to the environment and think about the consequences. Um, so this bracelet um, was dyed using things like matter root. I used blood root, which is an indigenous plant. I grow blood root on my property. Um, you can also obtain it, um, you know, some people use it medicinally as well, but it's really important when you're sourcing your materials to harvest them responsibly or make sure that whoever you get them from is being responsible in harvesting them because you don't want to contribute while you're trying to move in a natural direction to create um, really nice long lasting art. You don't necessarily want to contribute to the destruction of the environment further. It's sort of counterproductive. So, you know, I try to be really careful and responsibly source. Um, it's led to doing a lot of gardening and, um, you know, just finding more and more plants that have really useful properties for mordants and dyes. And the, the dye palette is a little bit different when you're using natural dyes. It's not really identical to the colors out of the bottle, you know, if you're using writ dye. Um, it might take a little bit longer. You might have to dye it a couple of times if you want a, dar a darker or richer color, depending on the material you're using. But they do work and they do last. Um, I think you know, there's a perception that natural dyes must not last, but they're actually quite beautiful and quite persistent. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to dispel that too. And these are traditional geometric designs. There's a lot of abstract geometric design work um, in quill work and in pottery inscription designs. Um, sometimes I take some inspiration from Eastern tattooing traditions. Um, there's a lot of different sources. Uh, twined bags are a great source of really handsome geometric designs and also you get a sense of the color layout, design layout, proportions that are really distinct to a certain part of the country. Um, and so you can see a little bit of that in this cuff. This has been finished with smoked deer skin so it's lined on the inside and then um, you know because most of my customers would like to wear their things every day and have no fuss um, you know uh, attachment. I actually put a modern snap on it to uh, to be the closure. Um, you don't really see it because it's covered with leather but it's just the, the most practical things for folks to use now. So. Um, so that was one of the pieces I made for the collection. Fruitlands has some really beautiful quill work. I've been going to Fruitlands Museum for years. In fact, um, long before I knew Shana or Catherine, um, I was working on monitoring a lot of archaeology for my tribe and I was working on a huge site. Uh, it was a really complicated site. Um, it was a paleo onwards uh, site. So there was a, a lot of sites that we were, a lot of locations on the property we were trying to be really careful of and mindful of preserving whilst also, you know, monitoring construction. So there's machinery and noise and wires and backhoes and people rushing around. Um, it was exciting and it was really draining. And um, on Fridays, because my route took me along Route 2 home back to uh, Eastern Massachusetts, I would stop at Fruitlands Museum, have a chance to just relax and walk down the hill, go to the native galleries. And I would chat with, with whoever the docent was. Um, I remember having some good conversations. They liked talking to me because I had you know, knowledge of how the baskets were made and knowledge of the wampum and things. But I like to go because there's really beautiful moose hair embroidery, some Huron cases there. Um, there was beautiful quill work. And of course, there's a, a very handsome, I'd say early 18th century war club um, there. It's wood and wampum. And I think there's a little brass or copper. Um, and it's called the King Phillips War Club, uh, which is an interesting name. Uh, that's its own discussion. It was a really beautiful piece, very well preserved, and it really resonated with me. And my other favorite thing, which was in your photo, Shana, was the huge feast bowl. I think in the photo that you showed, it was sort of down, but it's enormous. And I remember going in there with other Native folks. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, under you the case. Under the table there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and I remember going in there with a group of tribal members, actually, and we were looking at it and we were speculating, like, how many, how many roasted geese do you think you could get in this feast bowl? This is amazing. I need one of these. Um, so, yeah, it was just a really good welcoming space. And I suppose I loved the setting. Um, I love that there was Eastern art there because it's almost for me as an artist, as a sensitive person, for me, it's like being surrounded by family. 
and I couldn't get that, you know, driving along the entirety of Route 2, I can tell you there aren't many places <laughs> that I could just go into and experiencing that no matter how much, you know, I think indigenous people throughout, you know, the Northeast have to deal with this, how many places you can just pull in and just feel immediately welcome and at home. Um, it was interesting to me later on when I was working on another project at Fruitlands and I started to really take a look at place names and uh, characteristics of places on the land. Um, you know, there's, there's something about the, um, the setup, the, the place name, um, my association that kind of indicates that it was definitely and probably should still be a native gathering space. Um, it seems like a really peaceful feasting place for exchanging ideas. Um, it's very restorative. It has this interesting characteristic. So I, I'm glad that the museum is there uh, and Native people have a reason to go there and experience that too, still. And I wonder, um, I'm being mindful of time, but I think we should go a tiny bit over the exact midpoint. If sure. you could speak a little bit to <clears throat> the significance of the the map. And even, sure. I mean, even we could be real with everyone who's joined us today that <clears throat> you and I talked a little bit about my opening acknowledgement and how it did need some editing and that there's a reason for that. And obviously it's a really big subject, so uh, you don't need to go deeply into it, but maybe would you want me to move the slide forward perhaps? Yes, thank you for to, prompting to me. Mention. <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of move forward and backward <laughs> as yeah, we go. No, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, so this was a, an in-progress uh, concept sketch. I just I liked that there was a lot of movement in it, um, so you could kind of see my thought pattern. Um, so, so let's see, where will I start? I'll start at Fruitlands itself. Um, in over the course of my career, I've I've um, worked for my tribal historic preservation office, and sometimes that means. Um, you know, looking at sites that are culturally significant in our, what we define as our ancestral territory, which is larger than Wampanoag territory, because it's also related tribes and also places Wampanoags went. Um, so in looking at some of the early deeds, uh, you know, it, it's tough with the deeds because sometimes the, the non-Native folks who are writing deeds weren't really specific in many cases, but sometimes they were referencing recognizable landmarks like the Concord River or Bill Ricker, or we're trying to negotiate the line between Bill Ricker and Concord, um, and there's the river and there's the Pawtucket Pole. So you have this, oh, there's a marker there that's reminding people whose territory it is, um, or that was negotiated with the Pawtuckets. And they said, oh, you know, this, this needs to be respected. This is a special use place. This is a boundary. There's a lot of reasons why a pole might be there. Um, and so just looking at that, I remember thinking, oh, okay, now I know who's, now I know exactly whose territory this is. Um, so if you, you know, then you can read about the Pawtuckets and you can read about other locations in Pawtucket land. Lowell would be in there as well. Um, and I believe it, it are sort of arched up to the Salem area, Nahant, um, and places like that. Um, and so also looking at those place names, um, some places continue to have indigenous names like down here where I'm living in South Coast, Massachusetts, there is um, Mattapoisett. It's a little bit moved from where it was originally. Um, there's Pocasset, there's uh, Sakonet. Um, those are all indigenous. Equidnik, Equidnik is, um, a quid is like a, it's an element that, that references an island. So Aquina, where my community is on Martha's Vineyard, that's a related word in the same language. It's a very ancient um, word that signifies being surrounded by water. Um, Musketaquid, which is Concord, the, the name of Concord, um, that signifies this sort of grassy area that's surrounded by water because of that aquid um, part uh, of the name. So, you know, you get characteristics of the land and sometimes those characteristics have long since changed and places have dried out. Um, or, or become inundated even since then, what, what have you. And so just looking at clues and place names and clues in, oh, okay, look at, you know, these are Pawtucket people negotiating this land exchange, mm -hmm. if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we know that oftentimes land exchanges weren't negotiated with native people present so so there's problems to that but um, that is part of the the way that I can kind of unpack because colonization did a lot of things one of the things it also did was it moved people I mean um, there are whole there are groups of people there are communities there are whole nations that have been moved you know as far away as Wisconsin um, folks left this, this area uh, you know because it wasn't safe anymore and because they they just couldn't accept the changes it was too hard or they were under leaving under penalty of death and they went up to Canada and you know if things still didn't work out in some of those missionary towns they keep going to you know Ottawa uh, and uh, and points north um, it's very different from southeastern Massachusetts but people were trying to find a good life for themselves and a safe life and so there's dispersion and sometimes that means the reality of it is there's dispersion of knowledge you know if, if you have knowledge keepers in your community and they die abruptly of plague which you know we're thinking about again because of the pandemic we're going through now um, that can lead to some significant gaps and it takes a lot of work um, communities working together people native people um, thinking about how family members expressed um, their knowledge of certain areas how they related to certain areas how they maybe didn't go into certain areas because you weren't supposed to because it was you know sacred in a certain way that it really wasn't for human use and it was to be respected in a different way and left right. um, all of that knowledge is, is built in and right. it's just working to try to reclaim it so it's interesting right. certainly yeah it certainly it really is and um, I think another thing that people might really enjoy hearing about from you before we turn things over to questions and if you had anything else you wanted to share was this idea um, if we're bringing it back to what what is the role of a museum mm -hmm. and um, how can museums um, be a leading force in decolonization um, this idea of agency uh, and the concept of agency um, and how we revisit the very nature of collections um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how museums can involve the Native communities um, to add their perspective. Sure. Um, and what yeah. that can do. Definitely. Um, so agency is really important to me because agency is what I, what I use and depend on having. Um, uh, in, in fact, when we were talking about a map, a new map, because it was a very, what I will call a colonized map on the wall of previously at Fruitlands and many places. Um, in talking, you gave me the space to express myself. And I said, well, I don't even know if I want to produce a map that looks like Massachusetts with, you know, regular place names or sort of modern use, I guess I should say, anglicized place names and indigenous place names, both. I said, I want to privilege native place names, native space, native perceptions. And I, I want to do my own map. So I, using agency, using my choice, my cultural lens as perspective and ex being able to express myself, I was able to say, I want to characterize the land as living, a living entity. And I chose a bear for various reasons. But I, I wanted to, to drive home that, um, you know, native perspective isn't identical to sort of the Euro-American kind of colonized view of the world with the hard lines um, drawn as boundaries and that's it, it's a state line and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. Those didn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's sort of the natural contours of the earth. There's the riverways that are important routes for traveling that connect us. So I think in trying to characterize the Northeast as a living entity um, and the, the rivers as places that bring us together, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a relatively sort of two-dimensional flat depiction of land with very squared lines um, that emphasize maybe natural resource areas for human use only. Um, and so maybe I, in a map, I can't really sketch all of the beings in the area besides humans um, but maybe I can just make it into a huge bear. Um, in our language one of the words for for bear is awaso um, and so awasis is another another version with a sort of um, different ending that might mean a smaller bear 
Um, so there, the both, both words have come up in our language and there was even a family um, who adopted their clan identity as their last name. So there was the Hawaswi family at Gay Head and you can find them in the records. I like finding things like that because it, it's an, one of those clues. Oh, okay, I know what clan they were. Oh, okay. You know, um, so it, it's really interesting to find things like that. Um, and so this, is, this was one of my early concept maps where you can see some of the riverways drawn in. Um, but this was, an, this was an opportunity for me to use that agency to express how I wanted to communicate my relationship with my homeland. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so Elizabeth, is there anything else you wanted to add before we shift yeah, over one to one more questions? One more, one more slide. slide. Oh, perfect. Uh, there we go. Bring a full Thank circle. You. circle. Since you brought the lithics up. Um, yes. <laughs> It, we, we sort of kind of um, had a meeting of, of minds where the lithics are going to be displayed, but they don't necessarily have to be a straight line on the wall as a timeline of what time period the, the pieces were made over thousands of years. But the idea of taking these materials and laying them on cloth to express them as belongings, um, these are all pieces that were made a lot of sophisticated knowledge by native craftspeople for over a very, very long period of time. Um, their specific knowledge of quarry sites, of the properties of the stone, um, of the needs, of what, what, it, what uh, purpose that tool is going to serve. Um, there's a lot of knowledge contained in them and there's a lot of work that goes into making them. And then I thought by adding the cloth, it would show a certain amount of care, um, which if it was your personal belonging, you'd have a lot of care for all of those points that you work so hard to make. So even though they're older and they look worn and perhaps some of them are broken um, and they maybe they were just found and there was no negotiation with the maker, um, maybe we can step back and kind of decolonize a little bit and think about, well, what if, you know, what would they want done with their personal possessions? Um, how would they treat them? How would they teach their children to treat them? You know, I'm thinking about long ago hunting ancestors or fishing ancestors or folks and grinding some corn or some seeds or whatever. Um, and so the cloth was a way to point that up that they're really personal items. And it also helped to resolve the masculine feminine. Um, it did a bit, yeah. Something that we talked a little bit about too. Yes, I think so too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, I think that too, um, a lot of arrowheads tend to get exhibited um, with a strong sort of association with hunting or, you know, in a stereotypical setting, maybe they're all considered as weapons of war because we must have been at war all the time. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, there's a variety of tools. Some of them probably were made by women. Um, certainly, you know, women uh, used a variety of tools to process vegetables and, hot, you know, skin animals and, um, we're probably doing some hunting over different time periods themselves. So there's a little bit of diversity, but yeah, all of that I think uh, remains to be unpacked. Yes, great. So I'm going to go ahead and unshare my screen okay. and then welcome Catherine back to our conversation. Hello. And now we can make it as much of a conversation as is readily possible via Zoom. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, Catherine, did you want to? Yeah, so I'd like to definitely um, start by saying thank you <laughs> to both of you um, for everything that you've shared thus far, um, but also really encourage everyone out there in the audience, please uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll be happy to go more in depth on uh, the topics that um, are of particular interest to everyone tuning in here. Um, one that I would love to dive into a little bit more that you just started touching upon is this question of um, masculine feminine. Um, you kind of hinted at a bigger conversation there. Um, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more to that. Sure. Um, so I think in, in Native society here at different times, I think as isn't any society, things change. And of course, they've changed again, um, you know, more recently with a lot of uh, other cultures coming in the area and having influences on us as well. And so I think um, men and women in Native society are equals, 
Um, but it's okay that they're different. They're not expected to necessarily be identical in the way they express themselves or in all of the responsibilities that they hold. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility. There's a, an understanding people aren't black and white. You know, they, they sort of run the gamut um, in terms of their interests, um, talents, knowledge, um, proclivities, and, and things like that. Um, so I think in terms of also space usage, there's this really careful way that things are laid out in native communities in native space um, where you have separate women, men's and women's spaces you know people weren't it wasn't that you're forbidden to go here or forbidden to go there there was a respect that people need space and they need space to do things and i think it's also the practical um knowledge that you know not all activities are compatible if you're thinking about you know day-to-day -day, um activities you you wouldn't necessarily want to be doing a lot of flint napping where very small children could go because it's a lot of shards of a very sharp rock um so that you have a men's space for that um uh you know if women are making some beautiful baskets and they're dyeing some rushes boiling them up it's really hot water there's pans everywhere, there's porcupine quills. You don't want your teenage boys or girls, whoever's playing ball, you know, playing their ball, uh, ball game um, right next to your pots and knocking everything over and burning themselves or making a mess or something like that. So there's this really careful, mindful way things are laid out. And sometimes when you're traveling on the land, you get a sense of, oh, this is a really quiet, laid back space. It seems like a nice little women's gathering space right here. And sometimes people are so disappointed because they want to hear, this is like a warrior's gathering place for King Philip's War. And there are a bunch of Wampanoag men here. I know it, you know, sort of things. And I'm like, well, maybe to you. I don't think that <laughs> this is like really, it's like inconvenient. You know, if you were in the middle of a war and you had to get to a place quickly and you needed to see that you were in a secure area and nobody was, um, you know, coming to assail you if the English were coming or Dutch were coming or French were coming, you wouldn't really want to be in a little area where you couldn't really see around, you know, and, and set, set the guard, so to speak. Um, so I, I've been to places like that and I know people want, you know, a certain narrative. They're looking for, they've got the, the mass historical signs all over the state, you know, commemorating all these places in different odd ways. Nobody really knows why the signs are there nowadays. If you ask anybody, where did the research, you know, uh, come from for this it's always like oh I don't know but there was a book published of the signs not helpful um, so there's there's a, a lot of nuance nuanced information about how land is and was used um, there's a real specific specificity there's a some ceremonial aspect to gatherings and to some of the ball games and running races and things that I referenced so there's actually ways to ceremonially set up those places and there's earth forming and things that go into it. Um, so much of that has been changed and erased with modern development. So many quarry sites have been blasted. You know, I could tell you about them, but I can't take you to them because there's like, literally when I say blasted, these places are exploded. And then there's an office park put in them with no commemoration of what the land was before it and whose the land was and is. There's none of that acknowledgement. So, it's knowledge that's not accessible, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, we have a question that's come in uh, that is wondering about uh, the floor of the Native American gallery that was included uh, in your photo, Shana. And is there um, a possibility of displaying a portion of that floor again? Um, that's a Great question that, so some of these are petroglyph designs and <clears throat> I would have to consult before I answer personally. So I would say that um, <clears throat> things change every generation too, like what might be considered appropriate as an educational moment or a cultural moment. And if there's one thing that I have learned, it is that I'd better have a conversation about, about it with people who know much more about it than I do. And I think of myself in regard to this collection as more of a community organizer and um, being able to apply my museum and gallery background to the sharing of it. So I would say that I have often thought about what would it be like if we 
are able to renovate this space? What of this space would we keep? What of this space would we not? Um, there's another additional significance to the idea that these are two buildings that had a prior use. There's kind of this adaptive reuse that went into the structures so that one of is a former schoolhouse that was moved from across the street. So it's, it was still built in Harvard, but then relocated and then given a brick facing. And then the other was a barn that likewise, this was farming land, really active farming land. And one of the barns was kind of taken apart, moved, and then faced in brick. And what of that context do we want to keep? I have my own opinion, <laughs> but I don't think my opinion is the most important part of it. So I would say that, yeah, I guess that's probably not the most satisfying answer, but I would say that we there's certainly not going to be any kind of wholesale, like just tossing things away because they might be deemed um, offensive or misguided from whenever they were first thought of as a good idea. It, it's a much more slower moving process than that. And some of the best advice that had been given to me about a year ago was, it's okay if it's going more slowly than you'd wish, as long as you're pointed to the direction you want to be going. Um, so. Great. Um, okay. Reading, we've got a bunch of questions coming in now. Um, one from uh, Nancy says, I'd like to know more about the sensitivity of grave goods often exhibited in archaeological museums and how museum practices are changing regarding the display of such items. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I can field that question. Um, so, so I can uh, share a little bit of perspective. So from a tribal perspective, I think I can actually reference a non-tribal saying, final resting place, to illustrate the idea that you know, you, you pay your dues, you live your life, you make your contributions, you learn your lessons that you need to learn while you're here and active on the earth, um, and then you pass on. And um, from our perspective, you go back into the earth and you literally give the earth back yourself. We derived our whole life, our, all our sustenance, all our water, all of our beautiful air that we breathe every day um, is that, it, that comes from the earth. Um, and the beautiful things that we have and that we make and that we're gifted. Uh, it's fine to, to have those things and use them and enjoy them and appreciate them, but it's considered important to give them back. Um, and when you're living, you're reciprocal and you're also carefully stewarding and replanting and not hoarding and not um, wasting, laying waste, right? And you go back into the earth and that's a long, slow process on a time scale that has nothing to do with human beings' lives, you know, over thousands of years, we, we go back to the earth. So when you're walking on this earth, you're walking on my ancestors everywhere, not just the burial grounds you know about, that you read about, we're everywhere. We're in all the trees, every single plant, we're in the air, we're in the ocean, we're in the fresh water, you can't get away from us. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't wanna be respectful you want to be really respectful and really mindful of that. I think it's, a, it's really wholesome and it's really protective and it's really connected, but you don't want to mess with that because it goes against the laws, our original instructions as indigenous people here, um, taking grave goods, disrupting people's rest, um, disrupting that, breaking that connection. It's a real connection with the earth. So you're, you're disengaging. Um, this person has passed on, they're dead, they can't negotiate them for themselves. There's none of the agency that Shana and I were talking about. Um, if there can't be agency, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, it's not respectful. Uh, people can't stand up for themselves once they're gone, you know? Um, and you shouldn't put them or their descendants in that place if you can possibly avoid it. And it's really hard to avoid with all the development that, that has gone on and is still going on now. But it's really important to find ways to, to be really respectful. Museums are definitely um, learning, I think, to consult with tribes, uh, be, partly because of the NAGPRA law mandating consultation. Um, there are limitations. So if the institution doesn't get federal funding or it's not a federal institution or what have you, um, there are sort of more gray areas. Uh, but I think that, you know, people are coming on board anyway and doing things because it's the right thing to do, even when there are private institutions. And I think it's, um, 
it's been a good experience and people, you know, I don't necessarily solicit a bunch of feedback after the fact, but people will reach out and say, oh my gosh, I went back to work and it's so peaceful now. I didn't even understand how, you know, frenetic and strange and stressed and strained the, the energy was. But now that it's not like that, I can tell there's a big difference. Um, so I think it's really worthwhile. It's just, it's a long, slow process. It's like colonization. It's, it's one of the aspects of colonization, right? Um, it's taken 400 years to get to this spot. It's going to take us easily 400, 500, 800 years to resolve this. And so it's really important to have patience and just buckle up and, and get ready for a long ride. So. Thank you. Um, this next question is uh, from Ashira, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, living on Wabanaki land in what is now called Southern Maine, says, thank you so much for this opportunity to learn. So much indigenous art has been co-opted. Uh, would you please discuss some actual relationships between art and ritual in present time, as well as the past, and how to decolonize that relationship? Absolutely. So I think, um, I tend to think actually of no difference between myself and my ancestors, any other tribal folks and their ancestors. I know, you know, there's so many uh, things that are thrown into that uh, from the outside culture and criticisms about, oh, you can't be genetically the same. You've intermarried or we think you've intermarried or maybe you have intermarried. Um, but there's so much here, our predominant influence is the air we breathe, the water we're drinking, the earth we're on, and you know, 10 times as much if we've been lucky or managed to get back to our homelands, tribal homelands, and still have relationships with the tribes around us too. We kind of feed each other and we give that back to each other. It's very nourishing. Likewise, our traditional practices and our language, um, wonderful if, if folks have managed to hang on to their language. It's amazing. There were laws against it. People had their children taken away because they were, you know, right here in New England. It's not just out west or something. So there's a lot of disruption. And sometimes there was disruption to art too. Um, but not entirely. You know, folks continue to do, uh, you know, there's different traditional arts. So there's pottery that's very distinctive. There's basketry, if you're from Maine, you know, this from uh, that's very distinctive. There's porcupine quill work. Um, we do a lot of things in practicing our art. We continue to observe our connection to the earth. We acknowledge those connections to those different beings in creation, the trees, the porcupines themselves, the bears, the, the whales, um, the quahog shell, if you're making wampum. Um, it's not necessarily, there's a lot that's below the surface. It's not just a dormant and it's not just a basket for potatoes and it's not necessarily just a nice wooden spoon. There's a huge spiritual aspect that's really hard to um, even express. You know, sometimes if you're, make, if you're a whale clan and you're working with some baling to make something um, or looking at your ancestors whaling tools, um, that's huge. There's a, there's a whole connection there. There's knowledge being transmitted through that material, through your fingers. You know, there's no book about it and probably never will be a book about that. But as an artist, you know perfectly well, you pick up something, you go to a museum or you look at your grandmother's attic or stuff that you have in your house, things that you've made maybe even, and you pick it up and you feel a lot. You know, I can tell just picking up pieces that I made when I was younger, oh yeah, I was, much less jaded. <laughs> Look at this. This is like really cheerful art. You know, it's just, it's not that it looks drastically different. Um, but I can, oh yeah, I was like 19. God, I was a baby. Or, um, you know, picking up pieces that, that my teacher made or, you know, my scrimshaw my mom made. Oh yeah. You know, you just, you can like, oh yeah, you know, I can feel her. Um, or you pick up a sash, you don't even know the maker or basket in a museum collection or the, some of the stone points. Oh, this is a cool person. You know, you just get that momentary glimpse of, oh, you know, and it's like they're with you. Probably, you know, we're native. We believe stuff other people don't believe. Probably they are with us. You know, I don't think that I could say that they're not. Um, and you get little insights and hints and I think help with your art even, help with your life, faith, you know, hope. 
in spite of the fact that things can be really tough and might have had a bad day and been treated, you know, really badly. And um, we still get excluded from a lot of things and questioned and people, people kick our tires a lot uh, to the point where I'll just joke and say, go ahead, kick my tires. I don't care. You know, um, it's, it's really challenging. But um, at the end of the day, you know, I can sit on the land and I can still feel everybody who's here and everybody who cares. And I know that I'll have the opportunity to teach the next generation what it is to connect in that way. Um, so I think producing the art is a powerful reminder of all of those connections and sometimes a little complicated to be explained in a talk. So. Um, and I hate to follow up such moving words, but I'm going to just add another thing you said, Elizabeth, <laughs> that I really liked that you said a couple days ago, which it has to do with that sensitivity to the timing, right? Like you talked about specific sourcing for a certain color, or I come to get sumac from around Fruitlands at X time of year and not at another time of year, and that the color might be different, or you might even be disrupting the growth cycle of that plant if it's, you know, so that kind of level as well, I think you could say has that spiritual aspect um, that it only makes the work stronger. Um, mm -hmm. But it also has that dual nature of, like you had said earlier, you're making something beautiful out of everything that there is. And what, who are all of us to say what function is, right? Like, is it to keep you warm? Is it to feed you? Or is it to literally like make you happy you woke up that morning? Mm, yeah, that's beautifully put. Yes. Okay. Uh, our next question. Um from from the audience is do you think uh, indigenous maps like the bear map could contribute to the decolonization of thought surrounding climate change particularly with the embodiment of the living earth yeah that that actually is is a real hope of mine um i've had to fulfill a bunch of roles when i was especially when i was working for my tribe um I would go to meetings like the there was a regional northeast planning body for ocean use and um it was one of those meetings where there were federal agencies there were state agencies and also the tribes in the new england area so it was a nice experience um to be able to work meet with and work with other tribes as well that's a really important thing um it, it's just, it's huge uh, it needs to happen a lot more often it's just not it's very expensive and very time consuming um but I remember there's sort of a difference in the way that I think Native people express themselves and the sort of the dominant culture expresses themselves. And I was sort of trying to communicate in the meeting about never mind about short time spans of some political appointee, you know, being in office for four years or whatever the, the political span was think in terms of life cycles or think in terms of life cycles of things other than us. So like whales can live for hundreds of years, certain species have been around for hundreds of years, if you can imagine. So um, they remember our ancestors and they, they recognize us. Um, so what if we don't think about ocean uses in terms of our lifespan? What if we think about 500 years and then work to, to the degree that we can restore habitat, cleanliness, get rid of the pollution, um, reduce the pressures on different species, reduce the amount of, of degradation of ocean resources, and build back to what it was or better, um, even if it is changed from what it was. So just having some patience, coming together, seeing different perspectives. I think um, having a flexible land use strategy, having this notion that it's not all for human use, but there's buffer zones that are you know wildlife corridors there's places where the plants can grow in in large populations so they have time to reseed themselves and gradually and they reach into their own genetics for the elasticity to be able to deal with increasing temperatures or inundation by a lot more water or perhaps it'll swing the other way colder temperatures because it's all happened here before we're not um, it's, it's happening very quickly because it's driven by humans, but it's not like change hasn't happened here before. Um, a lot of that knowledge is still in the land right under our feet, but because of our thinking and our preconceived notions about how we learn and how we'll know 
and we'll just de develop technology and control everything. I don't think so. Um, there's patience and respect, and there's the idea that, of learning from other beings. Um, for Native people, some of that teaching comes from, from that idea that we have clans. And, you know, depending on what your clan is, you sort of look to those characteristics and responsibilities for guidance on how you do things. Um, maybe other cultures don't have that. My guess is, however, they have their own indigenous knowledge from where they're from. I would definitely encourage people to go back and find that. It's important. That's uh, your last sentiment there is an uh, interesting tie to a question that just came in. Um, perhaps, uh, and then I have one more that I'd love to get to. Um, before the before our time is up um, so i will quickly say to those of you whose questions we did not answer today because we do have a few we won't have time for um, you all got your link today through an email to me so please feel free to if you have lingering questions you um, are curious about feel free to shoot them off to me and we can uh, follow up with you after the fact um, but this uh, related sentiment here is uh, from ruth uh, who says i identify a lot with what you say, as I am from a Celtic tribe, is there a point at which our cultures and spirits can join? Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Oh, that's very nice. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we are all indigenous to somewhere. And I think that creating that space for mutual respect of people of different backgrounds, um, of different traditions, so we can come together and talk about ways to carefully live. Because we're always going to be humans, and we're always going to be taking we're just very dependent beings. We don't, we didn't even get born with beautiful fur like the bears I was referencing. We have, we need to get everything from, from the world around us. So we just need to do that in a nicer way, I think. And I think by working together, definitely we can. All right. Then the uh, last question I will share here um, is from Nancy. And she asks, do you have any ideas how to incorporate land acknowledgement ritual into indigenous sites and or museum grounds? Sure, um, so there's different layers to it. And I think there's also what, what should be kind of pointed up to is sometimes a land acknowledgement really should be the first step. You know, so becoming knowledgeable about whose territory you're on um, and even tribes that have moved in and is now their territory to um, so acknowledging change, uh, acknowledging disruption, acknowledging violence, but also acknowledging that there can and should be some healing. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be a terminal point when you say, oh, I acknowledge this was, you know, Pawtucket land. Um, I'm not talking about you, Shana. I just didn't use it as an ex example. Um, keep an open mind. And even if you don't know that day how you can do something, um, if you put a question out there, it'll you know, there, there's just going to, someone's going to pick up the phone and call you, you're going to read something, you're going to meet somebody at the coffee shop down the street, and you're going to have that aha moment of, now I know I, what I can do. You know, you can talk to tribes. Um, uh, tribes are, are accessible. Um, tribes have administrative headquarters. We have public festivals that we welcome the public into. Um, when I used to work at the tribe, people would just come into the tribal building because they were curious and they just like literally walk through our offices and I, it was, uh, it was different. I could understand how they, why they were doing it, but we just, we needed a public space so that, um, yeah, that worked a little better than having someone walk in on my lunch. Um, I think it's, it's not so difficult. Um, I think that sometimes there could be a knee jerk reaction to, the idea that because so much was taken that native people are going to roll in and take everything back and it's just it's not the way that we do things and it's not our approach our relationship is um different i think to things and to the land and i think facilitating connections allowing people to visit you know you not every native person is going to want to share why I happen to share because I have a good relationship uh, with the folks at Fruitland. I shared, Oh, you know, guess what? I was at your museum every week <laughs> because I think this is a place of healing. Um, I may not say that to everybody. Uh, there may not be an opportunity. 
um, but but there was. Um, it's a publicly accessible place, so I was able to go there. Um, if you know there's a capacity to work with tribes and identify places and open up access in a respectful way, then I think that that's lovely. Um, I think you know just the the idea of conservation so that generations down tribal children still have the opportunity to go places um give some land back i mean that's a radical con <laughs> concept but um you know uh it's it's really hard we you know on, on martha's vineyard where my community is the tribe has um aquina has less than one percent of the land on that that island um and uh you know there's just uh there's only so much that, that we're going to be able to do and, and be able to influence in that way. There's only so many resources that we have to take care of the next generations. Um, and there's only so many sacred sites that we're going to be able to continue to visit. So we keep that knowledge alive and continue to teach about it. So it's, it's um, negotiating that separation, I think is something crucial that could come out of the land acknowledgement being a beginning. And just to build on what you said, Elizabeth, and as a arts administrator and someone working with the museum, I would just add, this is something that's been on my mind for a really long time, um, that in order to change, a land acknowledgement is a nice, is a wonderful first start, especially because it does have that complexity, enough complexity that you have to think about what you're going to give up say everyone perceives that they have a full plate, right? Or, oh, look at all, all the things I have to do. You have to give something else up. This has to become a priority. And I'm saying that as someone for whom I think about it almost every day. And the last few weeks, I wish it was four years ago, but it was really the last few weeks when I started to literally pull things off of my plate that I used to think were essential and then put other things right in the middle of my plate and say, okay, let's have the tipping point of that 400 years be now and let's have uh, the 400 years of reversal of things and really truly acknowledging it and being vulnerable about it. So this is a pledge that I have recently made and I just wanna say it does have to do with sacrifice but it's it's a in a good way and at first it might feel a little scary and it might feel like your footing has shifted from under you but in a sense i'm kind of putting it out there as um a person for whom i've i've been rapidly learning about what it means to truly take that action that sounds excellent yeah <laughs> i think it's uh these are interesting times that we're living through too um and uh i think that things reached a critical mass where it's really hard to um, to be deceived or to hide things from ourselves. Um, I think we're being given a lot of opportunities to learn a lot of things rather quickly. Uh, and I think it's all tied in. I don't think that the pandemic and the inequities that's turned up and the, um, the racial injustice that we're, we're seeing, the climate, it's all tied together. So as we start to kind of holistically reach out and reform relationships and acknowledge our connections, I think we'll be able to do a lot. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. As always, um, it's a pleasure, pleasure to spend some time with you. Thank you, this has been and very nice. <laughs> thanks to everyone who joined us. And I know some of you had to leave right at three, but for those of you who have stuck with us for the last few minutes, thank you so much. We're happy to answer more questions later or by email and we hope to see you in person um, if you follow us on social media we will let you know when you can see elizabeth's beautiful artwork in person okay. and i have no idea of a date sorry everyone <laughs> i do not have dates for that but we, it will happen so <laughs> thank you i will mention quickly for anyone who may not yet be aware um, that while our indoor spaces remain closed the grounds and trails at fruitlands are now open through an advanced ticketing system that's available on our website. So uh, if you do want to come visit us, we'd, we'd love to have you um, come experience the, the land and our, our landscape. So um, thank you so much, Shana and Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And lots of thank yous coming in from the crowd. So um, I think we will end the meeting there, but um, wishing everyone a great rest of rest of your week. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.